Mesdames et messieurs, la prochaine session va commencer dans 2 minutes 30. Si vous Ladies and gentlemen, the Merci next session will start in two and a half minutes. So if you could please kindly seat yourselves. Thank you. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, not only in the room, but also joining us online. Um, we are live from the One Ocean Summit in Brest for this forum cities that is dedicated to cities and their territories tackling sea level rise. My name is Lorelai Picourt. I'm the Secretary General of the Ocean and Climate Platform. 
and today I will have the pleasure of being your moderator. So to begin with, of course, allow me to warmly thank our organizer, the city of Brest, my favorite colleagues at the Ocean and Climate Platform, as well as Bloomberg Philanthropies for their support. So today we are here to discuss the impacts of rising sea levels on coastal cities and their territories. As you may know, sea level rise coupled with rapid urbanization entails significant environment, economic and social as well as cultural impacts to which coastal cities are severely exposed. Just as a reminder, by 2025, which is pretty much the day after tomorrow, 70% of the urban population is expected to be living in a coastal city. With that in mind, we understand that developing innovating solutions, coastal solutions, to prepare and cope with the impacts of climate change is absolutely urgent. So this, this is why actually we're here today. Uh, we have an exceptional lineup of speakers from experts to mayors to scientists and of course high level policy makers. We're here to boost concrete action towards effective coastal adaptation and resilience. And now, of course, without further ado, it is my pleasure to invite to the floor Monsieur Le Maire de Brest, our host uh, for this One Ocean Summit. It is a pleasure to have you and please the floor is yours. Thank you very much, but you can give me a round of applause after my speech. Thank you. <coughs> Ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, it's a huge pleasure for me to welcome you here in Brest. The weather is not usually like this. Uh, it's usually very sunny, so it is the occasion of the World Summit on the oceans that was um, de ce temps d'échange et mobilisation well of the president of the republic who will be here tomorrow so we are talking about our coastal cities and bringing together our um, work on the, uh, fighting rising sea levels along uh, the coast and in these coastal cities i'd like to thank all of the people for accepting to come or green to come here some people are here in the room diverse, hein, uh, with us today Malheureusement. And un, un réel de some vous people are here connected remotely, and we're very delighted to welcome here, you here in Brest. I'd like to address my warm welcome to you, to the people in this room, and the people who are following remotely um, and who are following online. The city of Brest is welcoming you, and I would like to introduce the city. We're a metropolis. We're in, based in a very mar large maritime region, Brittany, in a department, the Finistère, with 1,400 kilometers of coastline, a quarter of the coastlines in metropolitan France. Historically, our city has always been out to, or sea looking or looking off the sea milit for military purposes, for uh, maritime explorations in the 18th and 19th centuries, and also a, with ports that have been in operation for 300 years. And we have been dealing Brest, with uh, the rising sea levels for, for 300 years. Brest has had um, 40,000 jobs in the field of defense, um, building and maritime repairs, and also research in science and construction. The research sector brings together over 1,500 researchers in areas such as oceanography, bi um, biology, preserving, conserving energy, marine energies, and maritime time of cyber security, among others. And today is the development of a blue sustainable economy that brings together all of these different players, research centers, and companies on the territory in what we call the world campus for the seas. This diversity of women and men who um, hold the seas dearly, and I have the habit of saying this here in Brest, and maybe it's the same in your countries, that we have salty water running in our veins. And this is what we wanted to demonstrate and show and talk about as a welcoming message, especially at the Marie, at the Hotel de Ville. We, in the, at the Pointe de Bretagne, we've had major environmental disasters linked to oil slicks. We know what 
human means are required and financial means are required to face and fight and repair and prevent this type of event. In 1978, that was last century, but recently, quite recently, we um, had the disaster of the Amoco Kedis just down the road from here with 220,000 tons of uh, oil um, spilled into the sea and on the coast, and the local communities fought to um, clean it up. We also had a court case uh, that was held in Chicago, and this is a court case that we actually won. So the coastline is fragile, and this is also what we want to share widely we're in Oceanopolis. Maybe some of you have, who were in Oceanopolis yesterday we were invited to go there in the evening, and also here at the Plateau des Capucins, which is a center of uh, maritime techniques. It's called the 70.8, and 70.8 is the share of the, or the amount of the sea on our planet that we uh, wrongly call the Earth, which it, could be, it should be called the planet C. So 70.8 is a place where we can share thoughts on the uh, challenges for the ocean. Ladies and gentlemen, I've been asked to be quick, but just a few words to finish off my speech. Our cities or our territories are very different, but they've always drawn some of their development from this closeness to the sea, and this is the case here. We know the um, how rich the sea is, but we know also how, how fragile the seas are. For many years, it is and remains a place that is coveted and also attractive and fragile. Today in France, the population density is two and a half times higher to the average in the whole of France. But I think in other countries here, it's probably higher than that. The coastline has been made by, the, by nature or created by nature, but also often changed by human beings and to excess sometimes. The awareness of the weakness of these areas and environments and the necessity to preserve them has often happened late, unfortunately, for France. Without being too lengthy, I'd like to mention the, led, uh, the coastline conser uh, conservation, which is a st public s um, service, and it's there to restore and protect threatened um, spaces and environments. If the threats on the coastline are not recent, we have to admit that with the with global warming and uh, we are changing uh, size and scale in terms of changes, our territories will and are impacted by the increase in sea levels and also by uh, weather phenomena that sometimes are very intense. We've seen over the past few decades um, these disasters and they will increase, no doubt. We've measured the consequences, human disasters, but also the socio and economic um, related disasters. And it's the acceleration of these phenomena that are happening and that will have an impact on the whole physiognomy of the place. These threats have changed size and scale. The coastline cities, the islands, the estuaries, the um, rivers with their populations will be on the front line and beyond the environmental impacts, we will be having economic and social and cultural consequences that will be substantial and that the population's risk being exposed to, to. and I would add other consequences that are no doubt um, will no doubt lead to inequalities in development and uh, lead to uh, migrations and immigrations and thanks to this major threat. The first response is to treat the causes to limit the effects with, of course, the requirement to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. We, uh, coastline cities, along are in the, on the front line, and so this summit is the right occasion to remind us of this essential element. And we need to bring together in order to do this means that can also involve considerable financial means. But for part of humanity, the question of accessing knowledge and scientific data remains, of course, a major challenge to better anticipate and adapt. Now, a couple of words just to finish. This meeting within the context of this first One Ocean Summit is therefore the occasion not only to share Um, about these challenges ahead of us, but also to unite full forces to deal with them, and this at the highest level. 
and this will be um, the discussion that we'll be holding tomorrow. So I'm very happy to welcome you. I'll have to step out a few m for a few moments. I can't sit throughout this meeting. We have a few ministerial meetings. We're used to it, and tomorrow will be exceptional. I'll have to step out for a few moments, but I will stay in touch with you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mayor. Um, we, I hope that in this community we all have salty water running in our veins. The One Ocean Summit is the first event of the 2022 agenda. It will be a very busy agenda for the, for the ocean, and we really hope that it will set the tone for high ambition. So now it is my pleasure uh, to invite Madame la Ministre Berenger Rabat, the Secretary of State for Biodiversity for the Ministry of the Transition of Ecology in France. Thank you and welcome to all of you. I'm going to spare you a long protocol-based speech because I think that we all, pres all present here today, this afternoon, demonstrate action and concrete actions, and in fact we don't have any other choices, do we? We have a, a lot of scientific evidence and knowledge that's very clear. The warning signs are n great enough numbers. The rising of sea levels, the violence of uh, marine submersion is happening, erosion of the coast, the uh, salinization of uh, the land in, uh, in within the coast in encourage us, us to carry out concerted uh, action and share knowledge and means. And I think uh, that the positive aspect from this situation is that we have come out of a long period of denial. For many years, urban policies and technological and technical responses have been to try and slow down or even try to believe that they could stop the rising in sea levels. Today, we are accepting the vulnerabilities and the idea that this change in our uh, facilities and spatial awareness and management is, is going to happen. We need to design new spaces and get people to accept this. And this is at the heart of your thoughts and your discussions. And I'd like to thank you for this. And we also have to think about risk management that echoes the movement of population and the resilience that we have in deciding all together. And with on land in France, we have a density of population that is the same as everywhere in the world, very strong, very high, and has amplified and increased over the past few decades. We have 287 kilometers, uh, inhabitants per kilometer, square kilometer in coastline areas, two and a half times more than the average in France. Uh, that um, is uh, French people that are living around along the coast. So, of course, we need to operate in certain areas where and localities where they are very exposed. The coastline is a transition area between the sea and the land. We saw this a lot this morning when we talked about pollution and uh, preserving ecosystems. We also know how weak this interface can be from an urban point of view and in terms of erosion along the coastlines. And we know that there are environmental and ecological impacts that need to have responses in the ecosystemic systems and operations. We have very well identified causes. We have an agenda for climate action with seven actor uh, player coalitions that France, of course, is a stakeholder in. And with, first of all, the requirement to preserve, to conserve and restore. And I'd like to salute also the conservatory or conservation services for the coastlines. I can see Agnès Vance, who's here, the director. She, I would like to thank Agnès because it was a system that was very innovative and that really found its true place in uh, on our land, in our territories, and along uh, the coastlines with systems and structures that help the approaches. They bring together different players, political players on different local communities, levels, uh, environmental players, and economic players, and the more we find these areas for dialogue and common project development, the more we'll strengthen this necessary resilience. And of course, this conservation also comes into play along marine, in marine ecosystems along coasts, in potential capturing of carbon in these areas, because of course they are areas that are nurseries, and they ensure this, uh, that this nourishing sea that we mentioned this morning um, can uh, d subsist.
the cities and populations they harbor, of course, the first reason for, um, you know, for protecting them, and they nourish the populations. And we have a challenge that's um, essential, and the. We, this is what we see. Biodiversity essential needs in the, for the oceans are thankfully today very much linked to all of the issues to do with protecting wetlands. They are at the interface of this. And as elected representatives, of course, you are in great numbers today um, uh, with the knowledge that you need to preserve and even restore these wetlands. And you also know the difficulties of getting these projects to be accepted by the populations. For example, the 11th National Park project dedicated to wetlands. We're right at the beginning of the project to decide on this protected area, which is the highest level ambition in terms of protecting and conserving. And we know how difficult and what a challenge, um, great challenge, the building of this common project to protect a very unusual uh, environment is with such um, such major challenges. Of course, the issues to do with financing and preservation and carbon linked to low carbon emissions is very much linked to your territory as well. And we have this global uh, function of valorizing, valuing the services that are provided to us by um, the environment. And they are the key also to the um, challenges that we're facing. And they're also challenges that are very uh, make things very vulnerable, but they're also the source of solutions. And these are things that I know that you'll be looking at and see and um, researching this afternoon. We have, of course, dangers for the climate that are more severe, more frequent in their occurrence. And no doubt the most exposed uh, cities that you um, that you represent today know this um, because you have experienced them full on. We've had um, the pandemic. We've had the ma first major crisis, health crisis, environmental, economic crisis, and you are the first players uh, for the resilience. Uh, unco unfortunately, these are all of the um, dangers that are happening and in play, and we've tried to find laws and systems and structures uh, in emergency situation, in the emergency situation of the crisis with economic responses, structural ones, legal ones, on all different levels and within the communities, within the different, with the different players, economic players, um, players that work in conservation and biodiversity with regulatory and also financial tools. And the world of finance is also present here with us here today. And we would not be able to do without them within this partnership. We need, we have such means and requirements and needs. That, so all of this unification and um, this working together in the way that is uh, all coming to the fore in this One Ocean Summit is essential, of course. The declaration is something we also support strongly, and I'd like to thank the Ocean Climate Platform, the city of Brest, for welcoming this platform, and all of the players that are part of it. With the C40 Cities Climate Leadership Group, we also support fully your declaration in the challenges it brings up, um, uh, scientific and observation and knowledge and, uh, and um, all of the solutions, the hybrid solutions that we are designing together, and also the unification of means, public and private, in terms of financing, but also in terms of finding solutions, technical ones, engineering ones that need to be shared today, because it, our political responsibility is where it lies today. We need to make available and accessible all of the means to adapt and to carry out this transition. And I would like to thank you once again. I would like to wish you very uh, enriching, uh, nourishing work. I would like to thank the main players. Cooperation, solidarity, of course, are the only two keys to our resilience. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Minister. As you mentioned, we are here for concrete action. And we, we look forward to actions being taken as part of the French presidency of the European Union. So now let me turn to another uh, EU champion, Spain. Minister Hugo Morin, you're the Secretary of State for Environment of the Ministry for Ecological Transition of Spain. We know that Spain is an ocean champion, one of the leaders of the Because the Ocean Initiative as well. It's an honor to have you here with us. Please, sir, the floor is yours. Mesdames, Messieurs, bonjour à toutes et à tous. 
the increase in the rising level of the sea has shown since 1850, we have been projecting the increase in the rise of sea level, which if it continues in the coming century, and if they, unless, even if we eliminate uh, emissions, there's an inertia involved in the climate. So the increase in the level of the sea presents very many risks for the population and economic activities and low coastal ecosystems that we need to be handling with all urgency. But in a long-term perspective, by sustainable measures that can be reviewed and revised regularly. In sustainable development, in the, in develop, as in, indicated by the Nation, United Nations, in the, in the taking of uh, measures against climate change is the Article 14 with respect to submarine life. In terms of climate change, to the extent where it affects the, the coastal environment, these problems were dealt with by the European Union, both by the government of Spain, who developed various strategies and plans to identify and assess the risks and threats and to propose appropriate measures. So the specific situation in Spain and along the coastal areas, one third of the population lives in Spain. It represents only six. 0.7% of the land mass. In the first year of the century, those that lived in the, uh, in the coastal areas were higher uh, in terms of the sea level than the national uh, average, 9% compared to 1.6% globally. So the coastal area is essential for one of the main activities of the country. Uh, tourism. The danger linked to climate change in coastal areas includes the increase in frequency of, um, of storms on the coastline, an increase in the level of the sea, and erosion and loss of ecosystems that are key, uh, and this because of the overheating of uh, seawater. In compliance with what was said about Spain and uh, urban areas along the coastline are suffering from an increase in, in flooding which will increase in intensity, but also in frequency. An example, it's estimated that in the city of Bilbao, the level of, in, of flooding is 50% is, uh, higher, and it's 3.85 meters in 2010 to 4 meters in 2040. This being said, the level of flooding standing at 3.85 meters well, every 50 years, it increases um, every, 15, every 15 years. So the idea is to understand the extent uh, and the time frames of these risks involved in the coastal areas. Now, in Spain, we just concluded in uh, February 22, we, we assessed the impact of climate change on, on the Spanish coastline. Adapta costas, increase, including the increase in the rising sea level and the dangers involved in that on an average and over the long haul, uh, depending on different climate scenarios. Now, the plan provides for changes in adaptation plans in, re in response to those climate change aspects for all of the autonomous ports. So the idea was to draw attention to the effects of climate change on the coastline and the marine environment and the coastal areas in the second plan for adaptation to climate change from 2021 to 2030, which is improved and uh, it will be improved in September in 2022. 20, uh, the plan provides for developing assessments for initiatives in developing the coastal areas, implementing each initiative for adaptation and to provide solutions based on nature to stabilize uh, the coastline against climate uh, dangers and to uh, deal with the climate risk linked to climate in the actual construction of infrastructures and urbanization in these areas and to include adaptation criteria to climate change and planning and management of these uh, marine protected areas. It's essential in the coastal areas in terms of the rising level of the sea, the objective is is to do things on time uh, and by the means of uh, public works, if necessary, to provide defense. 
based on the criteria of efficacy and efficiency, but also through the promotion of policies and standards and actions to in the short haul. With the necessary guarantee, we have to try to free up our coastal areas from overpopulation, but not to uh, let be, uh, some of these coastal areas be damaged. There you have the dunes, you have beaches, these are very uh, uh, weak. We need to encourage them naturally to grow their resiliency and their ability to, de to defend themselves against the sea. It's really necessary to promote planning, urban planning, that's realistic and responsible with respect to that threat. It should be noted that the average cost uh, of climate change due to uh, construction is 2 million euros per kilometer, given that the coastline is 10,400 kilometers long. So, so in t with two kilometers, uh, 200 kilometers of, of um, cliffs, it might be necessary to invest 16,000 billion euros to adapt, you know, with appropriate work to control climate change with respect to increase in the level of the sea. That shows how much it's important. So the capacity of natural defense of the coastline, we have to free up uh, intensive occupant because it's pernicious and we have to uh, develop that. So the imperative is that public authorities have to invest in these efforts, not only by setting up uh, defense infrastructures, but also to encourage research and mechanisms of partnership, both public and public-private, to re replace activities that don't need to be located on the beaches um, uh, and, tides and subject to tides and cliffs and so forth. So it has to be sure and reliable and long-term. And we have to talk about floodable areas as well. Um, and it's important, one of our main concerns in the plan is to protect the coastline. Now, taking into account the effects of climate change, financed by a support project, a structural reform of the European Union, we should have a, a, available in October this year, there will be a consideration in the general regime of our coastline with a view to adapting this to the famous climate change and, 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 and regional planification uh, for those coastline areas. So the plan will define the principles and the, and the criteria and the methods for management and protection of coastlines on the national level and to define objectives regionally as well. So we, we need to, our management is a good management of risk in this way. We will improve protection of our coastline and we will be improving the resiliency of our activities and improving the relationship with the land and the sea and protecting our coastline at the, coastline at the same time. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much, Mr. Mohan. Um, Votre français est bien meilleur que mon espagnol, donc je vais continuer en, en anglais, du coup. Um, excellencies, thank you so much for taking the time to open this important session. And now to dive into the, the very heart of why we're here today. As we've heard, um, coastal cities and their territories are the first to face the consequences of sea level rise. So today, for the first time, we have convened mayors and governors from around the globe because they have one call towards the international community. And that call is called the Cities Declaration. And we have a very special guest that unfortunately couldn't be here with us today, but sent us a very important um, video. So it's my pleasure to invite um, the mayor of Lisbon, Mr. Carlos Moedas, um, for a few words. As you know, Lisbon will be hosting the June UN Ocean Conference and this year, and mayor of Lisbon will kindly read bits of the declaration. Monsieur le maire, cher François, je vous remercie pour votre Mr. Mayor, dear François, thank you for, and I'm sorry I can't be with you today at the city's forum. France is dear to my heart, and I'm, I regret not being able to exchange with you today about the future of our ocean. And by talking to you from Brisbane today, I want to reinforce my support for this initiative and to assure you that our city is at your side and ready to welcome your ideas, your initiatives, and your leadership. I am truly honored 
to represent the people of Lisbon at this forum of mayors and governors to discuss the role of our cities in tackling sea level rise. As a former European Commissioner, I witnessed firsthand the importance of preserving our natural resources as a trigger of innovation. Now, as a mayor, I see every day that there is an untapped potential for local government to implement innovation. In Lisbon, we are now investing in the concept of blue economy, and I'm delighted to share with you that I will create in Lisbon a sea hub, a hub within the city of Lisbon near the Tagus River, exclusively dedicated to transforming Lisbon into a world capital of ocean. We want to place the ocean as a bridge between the past and the future, because climate change is no doubt our biggest fight. There is no challenge like this one. So it is a pleasure to sign the city's declaration as mayor of Lisbon. This is an historical moment. On behalf of a larger and greater community of mayors, I have the opportunity to address my political and personal commitment by reading the following declaration. We, mayors and governors of coastal cities, from small towns to megalopolises, have come together at the One Ocean Summit to tackle sea level rise, one of the major threats to our territories and citizens. While cities are at the forefront of increasing climate disasters, they are also the first responders to climate-induced changes. We need the international community to rally behind cities threatened by sea level rise to collectively scale up action to strengthen coastal resilience. At the local level, we need improved coordination with national coastal policies. Sea level rise cannot be tackled through a one-size-fits-all response, yet this response must include science, social welfare, finance, concrete solutions. Therefore, we, mayors and governors of the world's coastal cities, call for the scaling up of mitigation and adaptation action to limit the impacts of sea level rise on cities, communities and their territories." End of quote. To conclude, I want to invite you all to come to Lisbon, the capital of the ocean, as we call it, for the second UN Ocean Conference. My friends, all Portuguese poets, have mentioned the importance of the ocean. In the ocean, we built heroes, we fought battles. In the ocean, we achieved peace. Fernando Pessoa said, in the ocean, we mirror our skies. In the ocean, we mirror our future. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mayor Moedas, for your inspiring words. And uh, we heard you loud and clear, and we'll all be at the UN Ocean Conference in June for further action. So as Mayor Moda has just uh, mentioned, the city's declaration is built around four pillars, science, social issues, solutions, and finance. So to better understand a little bit how to scale up um, successful adaptation to sea level rise, I'll call on our first panel of experts um, to discuss these four pillars. Please, Dr. Anthony Rea, Dr. Tania Brodier-Rudolf, Monsieur Romain Troublé, Monsieur Keith Logan, can you please join us on stage? <laughs> you all have microphones on your chair. Perfect. So, first, um, we've heard it a lot in the last uh, in the last few days about science. Decisions should be science-based. So maybe as a first step, Dr. Anthony Rea, could you? Maybe let us know a little bit about the conclusions of the latest uh, scientific reports regarding sea level rise, and what are the you know how can we mobilize science and observation systems to to guide adaptation to sea level rise? Please. Uh, thank you, thank you very much, Laura Lee, for the introduction. And uh, my apologies, I speak in English. Uh, mon français n'est pas assez pour uh, dire tellement clair. Uh, so I will I'll summarize uh, some of the findings from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. This is an intergovernmental body that's, that was founded in 1988 by the United Nations Environment Program and the, the WMO, the World Meteorological Organization, where, where I am based. Uh, so maybe just to say that this, this is not a group of, of alarmists. This is a group of very, very sober, conservative scientists. Uh, I'm 
going to talk to you about uh, two reports. There's a special report on the impacts of climate change on ocean and cryosphere that was released last year, and also a special report on the, the keeping global warming below 1.5 degrees. So ocean and cryosphere, we, we need to talk about those together because the, the, the changes to the cryosphere are driving very significantly the changes uh, that we're seeing in the oceans. And the consequences of these changes for nature and for humanity are very sweeping and can be very severe. So if we talk about sea level rise, in summary, the, the Greenland and the Antarctic ice sheets are melting and they are the major cause of global sea level rise, and that's outpacing thermal expansion. So we know that the oceans also expand because they're getting warmer, but the effect of uh, melting ice is greater than that effect. During the 20th century, uh, global sea level rose by about 15 centimetres, uh, and it's currently rising twice at twice that rate and accelerating. Uh, also, as a side, uh, marine heat waves have also doubled in frequency since the 1980s. So what's causing sea level rise? There, there are a number of factors, actually. It's, it's complex. The, there's terrestrial water storages uh, uh, may be depleted, and this, this is leading to more water in the oceans. The, the, we also need to take into, effect the, the, into, into account the, the impacts of, of subsidence, where the land might be sinking, and tectonic di displacement. There's the thermal expansion, as I mentioned, and then the melting of surface ice sheets and glaciers. And we can observe these changes. So as I mentioned, a sea level rise uh, from 1902 to 2015 is 0.16 metres, which is unprecedented in the previous period. Uh, and as I mentioned, the ice sheets and the glaciers are the dominant source of the sea level rise. Since the 1970s, the, the dominant cause of this has been anthropogenic forcing, so us burning fossil fuels and putting those into the atmosphere. Uh, so in terms of the current status, uh, the, the sea level rise has accelerated due to increased loss from Antarctica and uh, Greenland, uh, and the mass loss from the Antarctic ice sheet tripled in the period from 2007 to 2016 compared to the previous 10 years, and Greenland's loss doubled uh, in the same period. They're, uh, slightly concerning, but maybe at, at, at a lower level of probability, is the loss of ice mass in, in both uh, Antarctica and uh, mainly in Antarctica, which has the potential to drive sea level rise beyond what I was talking about before, tens of centimetres if, if these ice sheets collapse, which is at, at the lower level of probability, but it's still possible. Uh, this will drive metres of, uh, of sea level rise over a few centuries. So the projections for the end of the century depend a lot on, on, the, on the rate of burning of, of fossil fuels. For a, for a low emission scenario, we are looking at a sea level rise of 0.3 of a metre, so one foot in imperial measurements uh, by the end of the century, by 2100. In a high emission scenario, that is, that is 0.7 of a metre, which is, which is uh, devastating for very low-lying low countries. Uh, Local sea level extremes uh, that previously occurred once per century uh, are now occurring uh, and have the, are projected to occur uh, on an annual basis. So this is uh, coastal inundation, inundation of fresh water and so on uh, with, with salt water. Uh, in terms of the 1.5 degree report, uh, by 2100 uh, sea level rise is anticipated to be 0.1 of a metre lower than under a two degree scenario. So what I'm saying is if the, if the world warms by two degrees, the, there's a 10 centimetre difference compared to if it warms by 1.5. Okay, okay, okay. Uh, that, that, means, that, would, that would mean uh, if we can keep it below 1.5, that means uh, 10 million people less will be uh, impacted. So just very quickly, what do we need in terms of systematic observations to understand this? Uh, there, there are satellite observations uh, of, of ice sheets uh, and for sea level, uh, geophysical observations of land surface height, sea level in situ. Uh, what, what's really important is that we need to link together various communities. The, the oceanographic community needs to link with the geophysical community because we need to bring together global observations from satellites and so on with, with local observations uh, in terms of how, how the land might be rising or falling at the local level. Uh, we need to bring in uh, local and indigenous knowledge which also may inform uh, our understanding of impacts and uh, adaptation. Uh, so I will uh, I'll stop there because I'm getting the hurry up. Thank, Thank you. you. Very much.
Uh, thank you, yeah, I'm sorry, we're way behind schedule, so I'll ask you to be very brief in your, in your remarks. Thank you very much. Thank you, Anthony and WMO for, for your participation here. So now let me turn to Tanya Brody rudolph um, Tanya, thank you so much for being here. You're the founder and CEO of Environa, and you're also a research fellow at the Stellenbosch uh, University in beautiful South Africa. And you're here to talk to us a little bit more about social issues, how to include social vulnerability, justice and equity uh, within adaptation plans. Please, go ahead. Thank you. Good morning. Um, it's a great honor to be here and to talk to you about social issues today. One of the defining challenges of our age is to address social justice, rising inequality and inequity. The social issues around sea level rise are really important. They are the climate impacts, one of the climate impacts that are really human and really real and experienced in such a real and challenging way and very challenging to deal with. People's lives are affected, their heritage, their homes, their livelihood, and their, their spiritual connections. So the social pillar in the city's um, declaration is crucial for adaptation measures, which must be just and equitable. This means that coastal adaptation studies need to consider territorial inequalities not only from an environmental perspective, but also from a social perspective. The issue of social justice is more complicated in already disadvantaged communities who are already at much higher risk of sea level rise, generally, who are often least responsible for it, but actually simultaneously least capacitated to deal with it. Now, of course, what is deemed to be fair and equitable in society varies across cultures and across time, but we need to determine collectively what what level of variability is equitable in a sustainable world. Equity is what holds communities together. It enables nations and regions to adapt and to adjust to sustainable pathways. So the challenges we face in adaptations to climate change are complex. We have recognitional equity, which is a real challenge in getting people to understand that different worldviews, different histories, and different cultures need to be integrated into decisions. And often, even if they are invited and recognized, there is an issue of, of um, procedural equity where someone may be, have a place at the table, but they don't actually have a voice. And this is really important. We need to ensure that people have agency and a real voice. And for example, the United Nations Adaptation um, Gap Report just raised gender as one of the issues that's been insufficiently addressed. And distributional equity is also really important where the distribution of benefits and harms need to be equal between people. It's critical to ensure that we don't further marginalize vulnerable populations, especially in the fast growing cities in developing countries and also in areas where there's a large, this large gap between wealth and resource. Issues such as climate change and relocation are really sensitive political issues and very emotive. Um, they have cascading impacts, not only on the communities themselves, but also further inland. And the financial implications in adapting, we've heard this morning, um, adapting are enormous, whichever strategy is taken. And there are psychological challenges for communities too. Sometimes they have to give up their homes and they refuse to do so. There are communities who demonstrate risk refusal where they refuse to acknowledge that this slow creeping threat, which requires action in the immediate term, which may seem extreme, is very critical in the longer term. So these issues also need to be addressed at a multilateral level, and we heard that this morning as well, that governments need to reduce the disparity between developed and developing countries. I love this quote from Archbishop Desmond Tutu. He was one of our most loved leaders in South Africa. He passed away this year and he said this about climate justice. There comes a point where we need to stop just pulling people out of the river. We need to go upstream and find out why they're falling in. And what he's saying is that climate justice isn't just about fixing the problem as it occurs and helping people when their house is already flooded. We need to be looking at the system and understanding what the issues are, what the structural inequalities are, and addressing those if we wish to have any chance of actually meeting this in a sustainable and equitable way. So anticipatory planning, active governance and education of communities is critical, and forward-thinking mayors 
have a difficult road ahead. The city's declaration goes a long way to ensuring the commitment to address these social challenges. And I applaud the mayors that are here today to sign and call on all other mayors in all coastal regions around the world to do the same. Thank you. Thank you very much for your insightful words. Um, so let me turn straight away to Romain Troublet, the president of the Ocean and Climate Platform, to discuss a little bit the complexity of the solutions. Hello, yes, I will speak in French. Bonsoir, bonjour à tous, merci. Hello, everyone. Thank you for being here. I'm happy to be here on this. There are some hundred scientists and so forth in the world, NGOs, local communities, and companies. It is really a very shared dynamic, as it were, uh, participating in this platform. I'm happy to be here because it's a project that we started, Cities, um, two years ago after the IPCC special report on the ocean, which uh, to start thinking and to have workshops in different regions of the world to try to understand the ideas, the impacts, the solutions possible, and to meet one another. So I'm happy to be here. Very happy that 30 mayors have decided in just a few weeks to get mobilized about this uh, for a common declaration. So I'm very happy about that. Also happy uh, that One Ocean Summit has put on its agenda this uh, the Ocean Summit. Uh, so for me, this issue is very concrete. Every citizen can understand this, like plastic in the ocean. Everybody understands that plastic pollution and in the press and, uh, and uh, 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 citizens throughout the world understand the sea is going to go up and their gardens could well be invaded. So before talk about, we talk about solutions, the main principles are there's a sense of urgency. We, we see floods. We see natural catastrophes that are upsetting our lives of various populations and the economic life as well in different localities. We saw that in France with the, with the storms, but it's throughout the world. It's very important to know that that's urgent. And, it's in, and so we've been mobilized. We've heard the minister from Spain uh, speaking. He, he figured it was 7 billion, uh, 16 billion. Um, so how do you find the funds? Who's going to pay? We have to get work upstream to try to convince the urgency of uh, uh, people of the urgency of that. But you also need to attenuate. We talked about uh, uh, the Paris ag Agreement to reduce uh, the effects of climate change. That is major. And we also need to do this within cities. And there are many cities present here today have that agenda very much at heart of the Paris ag Agreement. We need to continue with reforms. So the solution, there's no mag magical box here, you know. We, we all know that. There are two constants. And two aspects of the solution is protection, which is the short term. It's like you know put, to put up uh, dikes, to put up, um, so it's building uh, to try to protect cities from that short-term flooding, which is already happening in storms in, in big cities such as New York. So that's something you're putting up walls. It's not going to last for long in the scope of humanity, and I think that. It's a short-term solution that we're going to have to replace that very quickly by other solutions, which are those of adaptation to the issues of sea, the rise in sea level. And also by locating population. There are certain areas where people were born, they live their whole lives there, and they're going to have to change the place where they're living. Uh, there will be social issues we'll need to anticipate. Uh, whole whole uh, neighborhoods may be effective. If, if the sea goes up by one meter, just imagine our coastline will look very differently. We'll have to move. And also to insist upon, uh, we talked about nature, and the mayor uh, from Brest uh, spoke as well, and Minister Abba. The issue is also to get interested in how ecosystems uh, can help us uh, counter the rise in sea level. And there's also alert systems uh, that need to be set up. There's a lot of issues with respect to that, which are definitely need that we need to think about. We've explored for quite some time, for two years now, uh, quite a few cities, and we've looked at what's going on in the field or what's being said. There are two constants that we observe in that respect with cities that are more and more uh, aware of, of these factors, the contributing factors. There's one solution. Is, uh, the idea is to combine what we're thinking about solutions in, in terms of spatial terms, but also uh, uh, the whole temporal aspect. 
We talk about 30, 40 years down the road is more long term. There's a temporal effect, and 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 there, we need collaboration on several levels of society. It's wonderful to have ministers here taking the floor to talk about what's happening. So if you have if you have things in that, both national. Um, cooperation with local with local uh, people. We talked a lot about social issues and sociological issues. We take the time to explain to people that, that we will have to adapt and it's going to happen faster than we thought. It's going to happen. It's not we believe it's going to happen. It is going to happen. Uh, two conditions to optimize uh, before I conclude. Uh, to optimize the solutions, to adapt uh, nationally. How do you anchor a national plan to be in line with local plans? And that is an important uh, uh, question. It's not easy to do in all cases. And to involve all stakeholders as well, as we said, the scenarios and the solutions for the future. And I really like the, uh, the way of the minister of Spain, uh, his point of view about the fact that you have to, f you know, to attach some numbers, uh, attach some figures to what's got, what it's going to cost, and, and about the, the various objectives of the IPCC, and to anticipate and work harder, uh, get the scientists to work harder. Thank you for being here. It's the beginning. It is really the beginning. We've been working in our own stories, but you know, I said to myself, it's an opportunity to ramp this up to a different scale. And we're going to be seeing you soon. I'm very happy that the mayor of Lisbon um, spoke us about spoke to us about the meeting all together to go back to Lisbon in the month of June to the Union Ocean Conference. And so let's meet there. And we're going to exchange more and to continue this story of adaptation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Roman. As you say, there's definitely no one size fits all type of solution, of course. And um, you can now turn to finance. So we have some very exciting topics here. Um, Mr. Kier Logan, you're the president of the Conference of Peripheral Maritime Regions. This is a mouthful. Thank you. And you're also the regional minister of the province of North Holland. You're our last speaker today, so please can you enlighten us about finance for adaptation? Very concerned. Yes, yes. Uh, thank you, uh, Lorelei, and uh, thank you that I am invited here to speak to you today because uh, this is maybe the greatest challenge of all because the science gives us insight uh, on, on what is happening and how it's happening and what we need. And the social justice shows us that it is an integral, integrated uh, um, topic we cannot do it alone we need to do that together and also the solutions are there we know what we have to do to prevent it and now comes the most challenging part how are we going to pay for that well my name is Kees Loga I am president of CPMR an organization that represents uh, over 150 European uh, maritime and coastal regions but also islands like the Azores Madeira and, and Malta and one of our key messages uh, is uh, uh, missions is to uh, raise awareness by the European institutions that we need money a lot of money to finance all these solutions and, and, and challenges ahead of us because if we don't do that the future gonna learn us that the cost in the future gonna be astronomical compared that what we have today now uh, for example, we have uh, from the European institution at this moment, from the cohesion funds, about 8 billion euros available to uh, battle uh, climate change. But it's a drop in the immense ocean and what is necessary. For example, the, my, my home country, Holland, needs 1.5 billion euros every year until 2038 to make our coast resilient. And we must realize us that not only the infrastructure costs are there, but also the cost of consequences of, for example, a tsunami in the, in the future, or, and that, that's, that's much more on the social uh, 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 side of it, but all the climate refugees who gonna call, go on drift uh, of climate change. So we need, and that's, that's a an, an, an challenge and a mission what we all must feel together, is that it is not only a private, a private challenge, uh, sorry, a, a public challenge, but it's also a private challenge. We need 
the private sector as well. We need insurance for people who live on coastlines who are not insured yet. We, we make that in place. We need small finest constructions for SMEs and, 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 and local communities. And we all have to do that from a multi-level governance approach. Well, that's, that's my key message for today. Thank you very much. Um, indeed, we're all on the same boat together for coastal adaptation. So, warm round of applause for our first panelists. Thank you very much. So now, um, we're going to have to pick things up a little bit, so bear with me. I might start speaking very fast. Um, so, now it's time to call on our main protagonists, the mayors and the governors of the world's coastal cities. And we'll start our tour of the world with Europe. So please, I will ask all the European mayors, governors, and representatives to join us on stage here, please. Um, just to give you a little bit of information. Please come, come and join me, I'm all alone here, it's not fun. All the mayors and governors of Europe. Do I have someone from the city's team that can pick them up? <laughs> Don't be afraid. <laughs> I'm not that mean. Um, okay, so we're going to start in Europe. Thank you very much. Um, so this is going to be a tough exercise. It's a two-minute exercise. So all your remarks will be timed. We've asked um, the technical team to put a timer on here. So from the coast of the Atlantic Ocean to the Mediterranean basin, the impacts of sea level rise will be different. And you are the examples of this. So we're going to invite you to share with, you, with us um, the specificities of your, of your cities. And to begin our tour of Europe, I will turn to Mr. Hans Werner Tova, the president of the City Council of Kiel in Germany. Please, you're the first one, two minutes on the timer. And no, no, you can stay. Yeah, ladies and gentlemen, Kiel is on the move. With its many topics in many places and with the overarching goal of making the city sustainable and climate, climate friendly. In Germany's northernmost federal state, Schleswig-Holstein, almost 25% of the area is only just above sea level. These areas are therefore threatened by sea level rise. This is mostly the marshland of the north coast, uh, and, uh, but also some areas on the Baltic Sea coast. More than 350,000 people live in this area. Due to the location on the coast and the rising sea level, there's a particular risk of storm surges. There can lead to, uh, these can lead to flooding also in connection with coastal erosion and beach loss. The Schilksee district of Kiel is particularly affected by coastal Erosion. Here the steep coast is breaking away at a rate of 0 0.7 meters per year and the first row of houses is only 60 meters from the break of edge. Although Kiel is not quite as vulnerable to sea level rise as other cities and other regions of the world, but uh, one thing is certain sea level rise is coming. I would like to illustrate this with an exam example. A new quarter is to be built on 79 hectares of land directly on the water side of Kiel's Holtenau Ost conversion area. This offers the change to meet Kiel's demands for sustainability, mobility, climate neutrality and innovation through its from scratch new design. However, since parts of the area are float risks areas 
and some have a low elevation above sea level and uh, sea level rise becomes a concrete challenge for keel here, which is also a determining factor for construction planning. The CT's declaration is of outstanding importance and it calls for the much needed intensification of mitigation and adaptation measures. Climate change affects us all. Climate change adaptation along with the climate change mitigation itself is probably the most, most important and challenging global, global uh, task of our time. We can only master this task together as a world community. And I'm very pleased that we as representatives of coastal cities have gathered here today at the One o Ocean Summit to join together in signing the Sea Ties uh, T's declaration as a call to action to be international community. I welcome all of your commitment. I'm convinced that we have much to learn from each other and I look forward to exchanging ideas with you. Thank you very much. Merci beaucoup. Merci beaucoup, President Ova. Um, Thank you very much, sir. To sign the city's declaration, which is on the table here, please go ahead. There are two documents that you can sign. Welcome on board. This is a very exciting time. Now we're going to go to Stockholm, please. Vice Mayor for Environment and Climate, I hereby endorse the city's declaration on behalf of the city of Stockholm. I believe the declaration sends a clear message to all relevant stakeholders to urgently scale up mitigation and adaptation actions to limit the impact of rising sea levels. Stockholm is a city built on islands situated just between the Lake Mälaren and the Baltic Sea. In Stockholm, the reconstruction of the lock called Slussen is one of Scandinavia's biggest building projects. The lock is both the gate of Lake Mälaren as it spills into the Baltic Sea and Sweden's second largest public transport hubs. The main reason for this massive redevelopment project is however not traffic, it's the climate. Research found that the original construction was not built to withstand the projected sea level rise brought by climate change. In addition to rising sea levels, climate change is also expected to alter weather patterns, resulting in more rain flowing into Lake Mälaren. The lake touches several cities and provides fresh drinking water to more than 2 million people. If the locks at Slussen are not able to drain properly, all of the cities surrounding the lake will be vulnerable to flooding that could damage critical infrastructure and crucially contaminate the drinking water for the entire region. However, if the sea continues to rise, eventually this construction will be insufficient to save Lake Mälaren and our drinking water, which is one of the important reasons to take action now and not later. Stockholm has ambitious environmental and climate plans, which includes our plan to become fossil fuel free and climate positive by 2040. I would, have a, however, like to stress that the goals cannot be met by the city of Stockholm alone, but in close international cooperation and with the help of technological innovation. Our policy is designed to stimulate and strengthen collaboration, innovation and communication. And I look forward to working with you all. Thank you. Thank you very much and welcome Stockholm. Um, so now let's move a little bit south of Stockholm down to the Netherlands and I would like to invite Mr. Jan de Boer, Mayor of Den Helder, um, to take the floor and you have two minutes. Thank you. Den Helder is the main naval city of the Netherlands at the border between the North Sea and Wadden Sea World Heritage, recognized by Napoleon for its strategic location. He called it the Gibraltar of the North and designed unique fortifications fortifications of which some are still in use today. 200 years later, the importance of our region has been expanded to climate, especially sea level rise. We are a city under sea, le sea level in a polder between three former islands, a city in an area where the sea level rise is already at 
25 centimeters about the last 100 years. Time to revisit Netherlands' most important invention, the dike. Dikes are the framework of the Dutch landscape and hold an important role in daily life. We Dutch, we live in dike houses and spend weekends cycling on it. Critics highlight that hard engineering solutions like dikes often disrupt natural water and sediment flows and do not adapt easily to changing conditions. Although the soft engineering approach by adding sand volumes to the coast had less impact, the need to add more sand every year unfortunately destroys some habitats on the seabed. We continue to invent for new solutions by integrating sea dams in our city for housing and other proposals. Two, by allowing marine life to migrate through our coastal defense and by generating powder from tidal differences and mixing salt and sweet water. But this can't continue if the underlying causes for climate change and sea level rises aren't managed. That's why I'm signing the CT's declaration today. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, and I invite you to indeed sign the document uh, which is just in front of you. So now let's move a little bit to the southwest of France, and we'll go to the beautiful city of Biarritz. Madame la maire Arostegui, je vous en prie, deux minutes. Bonjour à tous. Good afternoon. Justine. Christine. Justine. Oh, no. Storms. 2014, Christine. 2021, Justine. We were expecting it at level four. It was actually level five. They made s serious dis um, damages. They attacked our tourist infrastructures, economics. We have the economic ones. We have the only palace in the c on the along the coast um, that has just been renovated. We also have a casino that is a beautiful Art Deco building. These buildings get uh, make the city live and attract people to them and they have to be protected. The city of Biarritz is in partnership with the cross-border partners, Senor Moran, with San Sebastian, the city, among others, and we're working on models for forecasting, fine-tuned forecasting, which will enable us to know where the submersive waves are going to occur and how intense they are going to be. With this model um, built, we've also worked on protecting of protective tools, and we've looked and asked our local startups to do this. Wave Bumper, with Mr. Romain Chaperon in charge of it, is a startup, and this gentleman knocked on many doors. Not many opened, but the regional door did. As a customer, he arrived, um, he managed to uh, get the interest or attract the interest of the, American, um, of the Americans, and we're working on a very specific area with him at the moment, which is the point of contact of the uh, storm of the storms, and Biarritz, with its very small means, is going to carry out an experiment to defend our infrastructures with his um, with his system. And to finish off very quickly, mayor of a very small commune of 25,000 inhabitants, despite the fact that we're well known all over the world, there are only 25,000 people living in our uh, city. We work with the major, largest conglomeration in France, 151 communes. We need, and I think that the previous speaker was able to see this, uh, we need to we need to have finance and uh, uh, financial aid, the previous speaker said this, our startups need support by local communities, international and national people, and this is a plea for our startup, actually. Protecting our infrastructures will go over protecting our innovative companies, and I'm very proud and happy to sign in the name of Biarritz City this uh, declaration. Thank you very much for your leadership, indeed, and we'll stay in France for a little bit, but this time we're going to the southeast to set, and I think we have a video from Mayor François Comen, maire de Sète. Monsieur le maire de Brest, mesdames et messieurs. Mayor of Brest, ladies and gentlemen, mayors and governors, before becoming mayor of Sète and president of the conglomeration, I was a doctor. And when I hear the word resilience, I can only think 
of its first meaning. Resilience means being able to overcome trauma. However, our main role is, as local representatives is to avoid these shocks by protecting our populations and territories. In set, in the Tor Basin, the coastline and the lagoons are part of our DNA. The rising sea levels threatens our transport systems, our homes, our agricultural land, and even our drinking water supplies. After years of fighting, where man thought that he could ma master nature and handle it, but now we have to move to adapting. And this is how we carried out from 2007 the first French European project to, start to fight coastal erosion by removing the roads and moving them elsewhere and giving to our beaches their width and leave and reintegrating dunes and putting in uh, new systems. We pushed back coastal erosion and we pre preserved our coast. We've brought together the ingenuity of all of our scientists. We use uh, uh, wasted, waste cleaned water to irrigate. We reuse our oyster shells to strengthen our artificial reefs. And we work also on raising an awareness to pally the lack of representation along our coasts and the becoming of it. We are a territory that is on warning, that has knows how to bring together its agility and intelligence to create and invent solutions. Resilience, which suggests waiting, I would rather support and pr protect and uh, further our imagination. I'm very happy to join coastal mayors committed to fighting the rising of sea levels. Thank you very much for your incredible work. And we've also noted that it's not only the city of Set uh, signing the city's declaration, it's also the 14 surrounding municipalities. So that is quite outstanding. So now we'll stay in France still a little bit, but travel a little bit beyond as well. I would like to invite Monsieur Louis Thibault. You're the president of the club of the most beautiful bays in the world. That's quite, that's quite the natural heritage here. Monsieur Thibault, vous êtes également le maire de Plaine Fougère. Monsieur Thibault, Thibault, you are the mayor of Plaine Fougère in the, in the Bay of Saint Michel. You have the floor. Mesdames, a couple of minutes. Ladies and gentlemen, mayors supply and will supply more and more uh, human uh, food resources to human beings. We need to not want to control oceans and coasts, especially in this period of global warming that we, where, for which we are all responsible for the acceleration of this global warming. Actually, we need to change our behavior so we see the tangible signs of what we are doing, and this creates and sets off disasters all over the world. We see rising levels that um, eat up land in Bangladesh, in the Maldives, and even close to my, to my town in the Bay of Saint-Michel and along the Atlantic coast. This increases inequalities between populations and also social justice. Our members in the Bay are every day have to have, every day have to face this scourge, and it's more serious in bays where uh, things are developing, and that's why it is important for us to have these north-south exchanges. It is now time to go even further to um, tax or even punish polluters, but also, and this is our role, to teach local populations uh, because these are the populations that are going to be on the front line. Rising levels of the sea and sanding and, uh, and coastline uh, retreating, these phenomena are all over the place, especially in the Bay of Saint-Michel. Uh, and in Sine Saloon, in the Bay de Dala, in Morocco, or in the Vietnam, Viet, various Vietnamese base. We need to be aware of this. We need to watch out for it. The local populations are on the front line, and they are often totally helpless in front of this, and they are subject to these uh, deteriorations that deprive them from land and food, especially f also from fishing, fisheries, and also gathering of shells, seashells that has become impossible and essential for them. It really uh, leads to their survival. To um, find a solution to these phenomena, or at least to slow down um, the phenomena, our various governments have to take action. The international agreements and treaties and decisions have to be followed on by facts, and a police of the seas, of oceans, and coastlines has to be put in place. We are from the base in the world. We support this summit, this type of summit, and we are happy and ready to commit and commit our bays, coves, and inhabitants. The task is huge, and we were relying on the awareness of governments 
throughout the planet. Let us be responsible. Let us be forward-looking. Let us be NGOs, facilitators, and let's lead to help our governors to make the brave decisions they need to face with the, the uh, emergence and the survival of the sea that millions of inhabitants rely on. Thank you very much. And, uh, we'll, we'll stay in France. We'll go to the biggest coastal city in France. We'll go to Marseille with Monsieur Hervé Manchon. Um, who I believe is going to speak in Marseillais. Ah. Désolé, je, je ne maîtrise que le Marseillais. Bonjour I only speak Marseillais, I apologize. apologize. Well, hello to everyone. We're here to face one of the main threats, consequence of the uh, change in the, grain in the climate. I'm talking about the rising of sea levels. I'm going to talk about Marseille, where Bernard Bayon, the mayor, asked me to deal with this file and appointed me vice president to coastlines and marine biodiversity. And the, I'm also the representative of the mayor the, in the Calanque Park, which 80% of the um, of which is on the area of Marseille. So the coastal lines of Marseille are 57 kilometers long from Corbière all the way to the Porpin Calanque in the south, in the, at the heart of the national park. These 57 kilometers are subject to erosion of human and wind farm and marine, uh, wind and uh, sea um, origin. We also have the frequent risk of uh, submersion or flooding that le that happens when there is a great there are great winds and great storms on the Mediterranean this issue that leads to environmental problems social ones and economic and cultural ones and ones linked to major safety issues in Marseille is going to be more and more present and in under the uh, effects of um, climate change the consequence of the erosion on Marseille is going to intensify in the coastlines that are more weak, more vulnerable and and in the areas where the sea is, is winning over. So for example, the uh, sea park of the Prado, which is the only beach that's uh, wonderful for Marseille, people, people from Marseille, the area at the Red Pointe Rouge and Redon, where parts of the um, cliff falls into the sea. And then Corbière, the only little beach that's available for half of the city in the northern areas, which is the most densely populated of the city, that will be deprived when this happens of its uh, beach. We have to act face with this phenomenon, and Marseille has opened two areas for action. First of all, maintenance actions. They concentrate on the coastline areas that are most fragile, the uh, sea park of the Prado and Prophet and Corbière, and they also um, look, we, they, they concentrate on the public, uh, or, the, or the areas that the public can access, and they also concentrate on uh, on repairing uh, the, di the dikes and the uh, rocky areas. Sometimes the, um, the water has gone over the dike, and uh, this is really um, something that is a problem. Now, number two front are the, uh, is the uh, developments that are higher, on a higher scale. We are investing millions in the Pointe Rouge and various other areas along the coast, and then there's also we're also investing in defending uh, the sea um, park. We also need to interest local uh, social and economic players and involve them in what is happening and uh, also uh, teach them about erosion and the salination of the soils because behind this sea area we have a park and the soil is uh, filling up with sand, salt and putting in danger all of the vegetation in the land. So we need to be able to um, s remove these maintenance operations. But it's like si the myth of Sisyphus. Um, they're constantly cleaning up, and it's constantly coming back. So we need to find a resilient system w that is sustainable in order to care for our coastlines. We also need to define coastlines, and the city will have to accept and lose property. That's what uh, will have to be done with a great deal of fine tuning, and we also need to define the area where uh, the coastlines have to be strengthened, and that's work that we need to and want to carry out with you. And it's time to act with you. It's late, and all of the participants in this uh, summit uh, will be, I hope, with us. And that's why we're signing this uh, this uh, agreement. Thank you very much. Since we've spent a bit of time uh, in France, we're going to do a quick detour to the coast of the Black Sea, and I would like to invite Mrs. Mihaela Andre, the municipal councillor of Costanza. Um, in Romania, please. You have two minutes. Distinguished guests, dear colleagues, your excellencies, 
from Constanza, the most important urban pole in the northwest of the Black Sea, a city twinned uh, with Brest in 1993, with, uh, which it shares the European vacation and the Latin origin, I send you all, on behalf of the mayor of Constanza, Mr. Virgil Kitsak, a warm message of solidarity. The global climate change caused by greenhouse effect and pollution are also being felt at Romanian coast in Constanza, given that both air and seawater temperatures are rising slightly. It is assumed that the high level is due to thermal expansion and precipitation. The water temperature in the surface layer has a slight increase of approximately 0.02 degrees. The extreme weather events that have been felt in the coastal area in the recent years are also a consequence of global warming. Accordingly, Constanza joins the global efforts to reduce pollution and greenhouse gas emissions, a firm commitment of the current local government in our city. The mayor of Constanza, Mr. Virgil Kitsak, signed the Paris Declaration those engaging our city in the process of identifying local solution for obtaining a healthy environment for the inhabitants of the municipality as well as the involvement of young people and civil society in the implementation of climate policies. Therefore, encouraging public and private electric transport in the city, recycling using pa free packaging, green energy, and its use for public lighting, ensuring the access of our inhabitants to renewable and carbon neutral energy, and supporting changes in the economic activities of our city, which allow a faster reduction of their carbon footprint, are just some of the methods we use or we aspire to. The Sustainable Development Association of Constanza Country established last year aims, among other things, to implement an offer station plan for the entire country and create green curtains against desertification as well as planting trees so that by 2024 we can double the degree of afforestation in the area. On the other hand, in order to combat the effects of sea level rise and coastal erosion in recent years, in the area of the city Constanza works have been carried out to enlarge the beaches and protect coastal area and sanding, rehabilitation of wave breaking structures, construction of main dam connecting to the shore, spurs type dams which retain sand on the beach with the aim of increasing sustainability, stability. And moreover, in the autumn of 2020, an extensive process of expanding the beaches throughout the resort in the coastal area began, a process that was carried out mainly with European funds and will be completed this year. The beaches of Mamaya Resort, part of Constanza municipality, but also of the South Resort have been widened by 150 meters. The total value of this investment is about 840 million euro and the area of the new beaches has increased by 226 hectares. There is so much to say and to do in this area, but unfortunately times do not allow me to continue. Last but not least, I take this opportunity to address to you all, all a warm invitation to visit Constanza Port on the Black Sea, capital of southeastern Romania, the eastern naval border of the EU, and NATO, bridge between geopolitical worlds and exponential developing city. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, and we're really excited to work with Constanza. And now, to finalize our tour of Europe, let's go back to France, of course, with the city of Nice. And we have the pleasure of having Madame Aurore Asso. You're the municipal advisor and subdelegate to the literal sea and ecology of the Metropolitan Council of Nice. Côte d'Azur. Bonjour à tous. Hello everyone. Je suis uh, conseillère municipale à la mer et à l'écologie et j'ai le plaisir de Councillor I work with the, the mayor on ecology. He's in charge of the met metropolitan area of Nice et Côte d'Azur. We are extremely mobilized to fight against climate um, global warming and to adapt. In 2020 we had the Alex storm. Uh, which opened our eyes, uh, uh, opened the eyes of citizens on the coastline 
l'occurrence about the occurrence of natural catastrophes which was increasing with climate change and the, the storm it was a whole the area that was concerned with the villages destroyed and millions of euros of damages in the infrastructure that were destroyed so we were forced to open our eyes again and our reaction was simple as is the case for all the coastal uh, uh, islands that are concerned by flood, uh, flooding there's no point in repeating this so I think it's urgent to observe and to continue to observe uh, climate change, climate, global warming with our observation uh, organization. We saw it was a real catalyzer with this storm and we have experts on climate now to continue to observe global warming, to fight against it and adapt to it. We are reviewing all of the actions that we talked about this afternoon, limiting uh, greenhouse gas emissions with an ambitious plan which plans this over a long, the long haul with minus 22% of greenhouse gases by 2026, minus 55 by 2030, and carbon neutrality by 2050, which we all uh, sincerely desire. And also other adaptation methods we haven't talked much about is vegetalization. Planting. That's uh, also to ra raise awareness because when you look at the green swath, it's minus one degree in that area. So that's really a question of awareness. It's, it's basically it's an adaptation. It's not, you have to talk about adaptation to uh, to take this in hand. And I'll keep it short because I know there's a timing here. But the, something that's current now for the next municipal meeting, we're going to have a, a vote, a discussion, to follow, keep track of the erosion of the coastline, because we have the Promenade des Anglais, and uh, it's kind of a mythical area for people to, 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 to walk around in. So we're going to uh, have, assess the uh, coastline and have this be part of the the French uh, management of this as a whole for France. What's pleasant this afternoon is to see that we have actions that are shared, despite the geography which separates us. And uh, I would like to thank the Ocean Platform, Ocean and Climate Platform, for getting us together today. There, uh, today, which, as the Mayor of Lisbon said earlier, it's a, it's a, there's the Conference of the United Nations in June to continue our efforts together. Thank you very much. Thank you. And you're invited to sign the declaration. We're done with Europe, and it's about time we cross the Mediterranean to go to the South Bank. And I will invite our next three mayors and to join us on, on stage to discover what's happening in Africa. So, of course, in Africa, extreme sea level events are expected to become more frequent, which will also put millions of people at risk and their livelihoods at risk as well. So now let's begin with our tour. We're going to have to switch places. Thank you very much. <laughs> we're swimming across the Mediterranean. Now we're going across. Thank you very much. OK, so now we're going to start our tour of Africa with Tunisia. And I would like to invite Monsieur Kamel Benamara, the mayor of Bizert, to be the first one to take the floor. And again, in Africa, we're going to have to keep to the two minutes here. I have to rep you know, repeat it. I'm sorry. Well, uh, thank you very much, uh, Excellency uh, Mayor of Brest, uh, distinguished colleagues, uh, mayors, uh, responsibles and participants. I am very honored uh, to address you today at the one summit for uh, which to congratulate the organizers is for me an obligation. Just a few words about the city of Bizarre. It is a city uh, in the most uh, north septentrional point uh, of Africa, built uh, almost uh, 3,000 years ago. It used to be a Phoenician port, then through ages it is a port and industrial city with five terminals and uh, 2,000, uh, 200,000 uh, uh, inhabitants. Well, uh, sea uh, level rise, it is a reality. Unfortunately, which is denied by many. And many people, most of 
them uh, politics, do not deny this. And do not take the necessary measures to uh, work against this, uh, this reality. It has and continue to very adversely impact many cities and Bizert, literal, has lost most of its best magnificent beaches, unfortunately, through 30 years. And the related ecosystem which is relevant to, the, to it. Sea level rise, I will repeat it, is also a reality. It costs very high to cities. And the city of Bizert and the environmental ministry has mobilized uh, ocean studies to re rehabilitate uh, just a very small part of its littoral, which is costing us 35 million euros. And the works will start hopefully by the next by, by the end of this uh, of, the, of this uh, of this year. This is just to warn everybody. It is very costly. It uh, do damage to people, and this is why I'm am amongst you here today and make the travel to come and sign this uh, chart. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much, and now we will go to the Ivory Coast with Monsieur Sylvestre Mou, the mayor of Port Boite. It's a pleasure to have you with us, and please, you have two minutes. Thank you. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Dr. Imu Sylvestre. I'm mayor of Port Bouy, which is a, a coastline um, community on, in Côte d'Ivoire. Our com commune is between uh, the sea and the Laguna. It has a surface area of 1,111 square kilometers. It's on the sea level of 30 kilometers with a very cosmopolitan population. 800,000 people live there. It is the main entry port for Côte d'Ivoire by air with the international airport Félix Fort Boyer by road with the mo motorway towards Ghana, from Ghana, and also by water, by, by the seas, with the port of Abidjan, with the Canal de Vridi was, uh, was made or built in 1951, linked to the rising in seawaters and led to an, a very violent aggression of our bay, which leads to, um, to erosion and is threatening uh, the disappearance of certain areas, such as we we have many hotels and restaurants that are being pulled down, or even and even jobs by this erosion. Now, it's, we need to understand that the situation is becoming more and more serious. The sea is moving forward by one to three meters per year. This is the reason I am using the, this time here in front of you to call for public and private partners to slow down the dramatic um, erosion caused by the sea, the breaking of the multi-secular environment, uh, ecological um, environment that is present in our commune and city. This essential um, um, refurbishment will require huge financial means. Whatever the means dedicated, the only ones that will produce sustainable uh, and sustainable uh, results will be the associating of the local population in a participative system. And I hope that one, the One Ocean Summit will bring an adapted and sustainable uh, result and um, response to this, these concerns we have. Thank you very much. Now let me turn to the Honourable Commissioner, Monsieur Tunji Bello. Uh, you're the Commissioner for the Environment and Water Resources of Lagos in Nigeria. And please, you have two minutes. You're the biggest city in Africa. We're so excited to have you here. Thank you very much, and we are very happy to be here. Now, if you look at the map of Nigeria, Lagos was formerly the Nigeria capital city. And in 1991, when the capital city moved to Abuja, we now have, it now became the most commercial, the commercial capital of Nigeria is most cosmopolitan. In terms of population, it has 20, 22 million people living there. But in terms of land size, it's the smallest state out of the 36 states in Nigeria just about less than 4,000 kilometer, uh, square kilometers from Nigeria. 
So now from the, it has a boundary on the west side with the Republic of Benin. So on that part, we don't have a sea encroachment. But if you move to the central part of Lagos, the commercial terminal, that's why you have the sea, sea encroachment. When we're growing up, we used to walk about two kilometers before you see the ocean. Now, over the years, by 1990s, the ocean rise are taking over the dual carriageway in the, in the city, in the coastal city. So by 2005, our government decided to take it over from the federal government and say, okay, we are going to create, we are going to find a solution to it. Otherwise, the whole city will be eaten up, given the size. So what we did was to now, to start re-engineering. How do you drive the ocean back and so on? So we brought the Dutch experts from, um, from Holland and so on. We are now trying to create a city from it. So, so far now, we have taken over, we have been able to recover about 6.5 kilometers of the city. So you have to walk about three kilometers now to see the ocean. So a new city is now emerging. So we have created about 1,000 hectares of land with a new city now emerging. So in the first phase, our target is to reach about 8.5 kilometers. We have, taken, we have recovered six kilometers now. So it remains about two kilometers to recover before we move to the second phase and so on. So it's, a, it's been a great challenge, requiring a lot of finance, a lot of work, and so on. So we are here to exchange idea to see what we can do, to see how we can collaborate, and see how we can uh, evolve more solutions to our cities. But by so far and large, at least we, we, are, we are making progress in that regard, and so on. But there are a lot of communities that are impacted as you move towards the eastern part of Lagos, because the ocean keeps coming. When you drive it further, keeps moving, moving, so, and that will be our second phase to see, find what we are going to do about it. So we're very happy to be here, and we would like to see what the future holds for us. So merci beaucoup, thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much for your kind words. Thank you very, very much, sir. Now, since we have been way over time, uh, we're gonna have to do a very, very quick tour of the world. Um, most unfortunately, we have received videos from across the globe, from mayors and governors in North and South America, in Asia as well, but we won't have time to play them. We will make sure um, to, to make them available online on the website of the Ocean and, and Climate Platform. But we have received incredible support, and you can see the map behind me. I'm gonna quickly list you the 30 cities that have come together for this city's declaration. Um, so first of all, in, in the United States, we have Houston, Houston, Texas, of course. We also have New Orleans, which is such a landmark um, city. We also, in the Caribbean, we had the mayor of pointe à pitre in Guadeloupe that has committed to signing the city's declaration. And if we go further south in Brazil, we had the city of um, Salvador in Brazil. Um, if we now go to Asia as well, you will see that we have received commitments from the governor of Aichi as well as the governor of Bangkok. They are extremely um, on board to tackle sea level rise through the city's declaration and we're so very grateful. Once again, I am deeply sorry that we're not able to play those videos, but they will be make, made available online. Um, so now that this tour of the world is, uh, is done, again, we have 30 cities. Um, you all know that the One Ocean Summit was announced quite late in the agenda, so that is quite remarkable that we have uh, that many cities that are excited to start initiate work here in Brest, and of course the next step is Lisbon. And to finish this uh, amazing session, um, I'm gonna call Minister Fai from Senegal. Please, you're providing closing remarks and, and we're so honored to, to have you here. Thank you very much. Hello everyone. I wanted first of all to thank the organizers of this summit. Thank you for your invitation. I'm Mansour Fayi. I'm mayor of the city of Saint Louis. I 
I was uh, elected last year. My city, Sari, is uh, a coastal city on the, on the Atlantic Ocean, which has uh, built in 1930 a, a protection wall, uh, a dike, by the governor at the time. Uh, Saint Louis was a French colony at the time. In 1957, we observed that that wall was being uh, attacked, but th it was 100 meters deep at, at the time. In the, in the 80s, as a young man, we used to walk uh, 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 to reach the beach. We, we had to, to, to walk about 100 meters to get to the water. And a few, later, a a few years ago, with the phenomena of uh, climate change, we observed several times uh, very aggressions along the coastline, which um, in 2017 we uh, argumented, uh, 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 we opened a discussion with the World Bank about this in Washington. And in the same year, in December, uh, uh, 2017, in one planet summit, we pleaded to find solutions because our communities were, were threatened by the advancement of the sea. And President Macron uh, in Saint Louis accompanied, uh, accompanied people from the World Bank. And today, a provisional solution is currently being uh, provided. Another protective dike, uh, roughly two and a half kilometers long, and a, pro a program for displacement of the population from that area because it is uh, the most populated region in terms of density. So we're going to be moving one part of that population to bring them out to the interior of the continent. And and to protect them from maritime environments. So the question that I had is the following. In 1927, a, a, a wall was built. It didn't stop the, the sea. And today, we're building another wall. Is, will this wall be able to contain the advancement of the sea? Because there, the level of the sea is rising. And there's another phenomenon that is there human intervention, which contributes naturally to the deregulation. And these are issues, that, the questions that need to be uh, asked above and beyond the declaration. We need for this question to be, uh, to be looked more closely at. Today, there's a, a neighboring country who, who has infrastructures on the maritime side, and these infrastructures will contribute to the degradation of that facade because we know that the sediment in West Africa comes from above, upstream. It comes from Maghreb, from Tunisia, Morocco, and so forth, and it comes down uh, to West Africa. So if we produce infrastructures that are obstacles, naturally, what the sea carries upstream is going to come downstream, and that's going to give rise to real issues and, and in, in, in increase the, uh, the damage. So all of these questions need to be taken into account, and um, this is what I'm uh, arguing for at this meeting together uh, to, uh, to sign the, uh, this uh, declaration. We need to take that into account to protect in a sustainable way these coplines with this particular exposure. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much for your leadership and we're so, so excited to, to have you join us for the city's declaration. Um, so we have had a tour of the world, but of course we have very important coastal cities here in France. And uh, in one minute, we have a very special guest, of course, Monsieur le Sénateur Jérôme Bignon, who will say a few words on behalf of the Association Nationale des Élus du Littoral, so the national elected littoral mayors. Bonjour à tous. Une minute, ça va très vite. 
C'est juste pour vous dire que l'ANEL, l'Association nationale des élus du littoral, que préside Jean-François Rapin, qui ne peut pas être avec nous, mais dont je suis... Jean-François Rapin cannot be with us. I am representing the Commission of the Environment. He asked me to represent him to say that today we are providing support of the 1100 uh, communities in the French coastline that are in France and overseas that are, uh, in, are enrolling in the One Planet uh, Summit for the Ocean and the city's declaration today. So we are signing it and we are with you. The whole country, uh, African countries, uh, European countries, other countries in the world that are joining together in this wonderful adventure. There will be small uh, communities of 100, a uh, population of 100 and, and larger ones in cities. So we're with you, we're gonna participate in this adventure as we've already started to do with the Ocean Climate Platform. Good luck to you all. Thank you very much. This is the end. We'll invite all speakers to come on stage for a picture. And thank you to the logistics team. They've been absolutely amazing. <laughs>